Hey, Crossover family, here are your announcements. Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., the Crossover Bible Fellowship family still gathers together for Bible study. Only for our summer series, we have the women studying Jonah, navigating a life interrupted. The men are covering the best of manifest. We hope that you can tune in for that, as well as our Regen youth and our Crossover kids. Each Wednesday night at 7 p.m., the Crossover family would like to congratulate our very own Brother Jermon Malone, who was announced this past week as the Dean of Students for Aristo Academy, which is going to be the school that starts here in the fall. Congratulations, Brother Jermon. This past week, we resumed our prayer calls. Our prayer calls on Tuesdays with the elders, Thursdays with the deacons, and Saturdays with the ministry leaders. You get the opportunity to partner up with us in prayer on either of those days at various times throughout the day. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays are our prayer time calls. Crossover family, you're gonna get a first look at the new facility, the new building, classroom. The elders are here, and Joe Bolden's here. Finally, on behalf of Pastor Blake Wilson and the elders of Crossover Bible Fellowship, congratulations, Crossover Bible Fellowship. God has made an amazing move in our life by allowing us to purchase the building out front. You may have heard Pastor Blake talk about it this past week. We couldn't have done it without you. Once again, on behalf of Pastor Blake Wilson and the elders of Crossover Bible Fellowship, thank you for your commitment and congratulations. As the summer continues, please remain safe by practicing social distancing. God bless you. We got some different avenues available for you to give. And so we just thank you and ask that you continue to uh, bless the Lord in that way. Also, we got our COVID relief fund. Keep giving a portion to that. We got people who are hurting, people who have been furloughed, lost jobs. And so remember those folks, uh, that money goes directly to people in need. And so we thank you for what you've done in that fund and continue to ask that you would just uh, remember those people in this time of need. Now, as we uh, go into our praise and worship, let, our, let us get our hearts and minds in tune, and we will be led by our elder artist, Wilson, and the praise and worship team. Thank you, and God bless. And we 
We can't let COVID-19 stop our corporate prey. All right? Let the nation sing with one voice. Let them declare to the world just who you are. Let the whole world know of your redeeming love. And the promises made in your word, they're being fall. Come on, sing, let the nations Welcome to Crossover Bible Fellowship Online Worship Experience, where we focus on teaching people the Word of God and touching people with the love of God. We are excited you have joined us and want you to know we are praying for each of you and your families. We do not take for granted your stopping in to get to know God or to grow in His Word. We believe these messages are life transforming. For those of you who frequently join us, we are overjoyed that you regularly benefit from these encounters. We welcome you to partner with us as you see fit by investing in this ministry so we can continue to make disciples of all nations. Please click the link below at any time to become a digital disciple and grow with us. Now sit back and prepare to hear the life-changing, life-transforming Word of God. 
Good morning, Crossover Bible Fellowship family and friends, visitors. My name is Joe Bowden. I'm super excited and delighted to be with you guys this morning as we continue our series called Just For You. Um, and this series was designed for us to look at the God of the Bible, to see all the wonderful things that he did for those in the scriptures, but not only do the things that he did in the scriptures back in the day, but that he can do the same for you and I today. So today we'll be looking at parental desperation, just for those who are in parental desperation. If you can do me a quick favor, whether you're watching on YouTube or on the Facebook Live app uh, or on the Crossover Bible Fellowship app, if you can do me a favor and just share that, um, share, share this message with those who uh, may not be able to tune in or may not be able to come to Crossover, obviously due to COVID, um, but those who may be uh, needing a good word, um, just share that with, with those. Uh, if you are on Facebook Live as well, you can do a watch party. Uh, but we want to get this message out to those who uh, may be in parental desperation. So if you could turn with me in your Bible to Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Again, it is Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. And it reads as this. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him. And so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. Verse 24, and he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garment, I would get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around to the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see that the crowd is pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. Verse 33. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, hearing what was being spoken and said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he, had, he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Verse 38, they came to the house of the synagogue official and saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. <laughs> Verse 40, they began laughing at him, but putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his, and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translates, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given to her to eat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this morning. Um, God, thank you so much for the, the praise and the worship. God, thank you, Lord God, for what you've done and continue to do at Crossover with the building and the, the land that we have. God, thank you for um, our brother, Jamon, God, getting this, uh, this incredible opportunity, Lord God, to be dean of students. Um, but God, a lot of us are still in despair. A lot of us are depressed. God, a lot of us are not experiencing these joys that um, others are experiencing. And God, even for us as parents, God, even though we may not be experiencing death with our children, it may feel like it. Um, God, honestly, it, it may feel like our, our children are going down a spiritual um, dark road. And um, God, I pray that you, you be with us this morning. God, I pray that you would be with those who may feel that way. God, I pray that you would be with me. Um, God, I pray that you would order my lips, God, to speak according to your word and your will, God. Allow me, God, to, to stand in um, and all of you, God, as you, you teach your word this morning, God, center us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have five points this morning. Uh, 
And our first point is verses 21 through 23. I'm seeing our parental desperation should move us to seek Jesus. In verses 20, uh, uh, Mark 5, 24, our parental desperation will cause Jesus to walk with us. In verses 25 to 35, I'm seeing a per, our parental desperation sometimes gets interrupted. In verses 36 and 40, 36 through 40, I'm seeing our parental desperation will cause Jesus to remove doubters. And lastly, our parental desperation will cause Jesus to raise our dead situations. And this is in, I'm seeing this in verses 41 through 43. So let's start. Our parental desperation should move us to seek Jesus. Jairus in verses 21 says, uh, so the Bible says, when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him. And so he stayed by the seashore. Now, Jesus is right off the backdrop of healing the demoniac earlier in Mark chapter five. And he crosses over with his disciples over to the sea, uh, over the Sea of Galilee and makes it to the other side. They get off the boat and they are greeted with a large crowd. Um, obviously, a lot of the signs and the wonders that Jesus has performed so far, people want to get a, get a taste of it. People want to see and be a spectator of that. But not only is that the case, I think there's also a group of people that are coming because they have needs. And they found out that Jesus can do amazing and miraculous things, and perhaps he can do it for them. And so they're there and they're gathering around him. And so it kind of causes Jesus to stand on the seashore. This is in verse 21. In verse 22 one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she would get well and live. As a father, we celebrated Father's Day uh, last, last Sunday. And as a father, one of the beautiful things, um, and I can speak from experience, is that when you have little girls, they do something different to you than, than little sons or little boys can. Uh, having a daughter and being a girl dad, I mean, it's just amazing. And I can imagine Jairus may have felt this way. He can remember um, all the beautiful things when his daughter was being born and um, the vision that you have for them, um, all the wonderful accomplishments that you're looking forward to them accomplishing, um, being right there by their side, all of that, right? So Jairus is a father that is potentially what we call a hashtag girl dad. Um, and he probably like, loves his daughter very, very dearly. Um, the Bible doesn't talk as if he has any other kids, but you can see the, the desperation in his voice and, 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 and what, how he's imploring Jesus to come and to help save his daughter. Um, Kobe Bryant, uh, when he passed uh, early in, in January, um, and him being a father of many girls, um, I think all of us as fathers felt um, the pain uh, of not only losing a daughter, but then him losing his life and girls losing their father. Um, and, and Jairus is in this position where he's not dying, but his da daughter is. And now it's fourth quarter. It's time to press in. Uh, Jairus has probably heard from his wife and, and his family members and those who are in the house. And they're seeing that his daughter is dying. And his wife is probably like, do something, do something, find some help. Right. And so Jairus is now um, out and about and he's looking for Jesus. Jairus being a synagogue official has probably heard Jesus because Jesus has come to many synagogues and uh, he's always coming there to to read the word of God. And so perhaps being one of the gatekeepers of the synagogue, uh, Jairus probably heard uh, a lot of the scriptures and is probably aware of the Old Testament and how Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament. And so Jairus is hearing this and he remembers that Jesus um, knows the word of God and is able to do something about this situation. So he finds himself at the seashore amongst all the crowd and all of the um, uh, 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 requests that are being made at this moment. And Jairus finds himself there. And he pushes through the crowd to find Jesus. With all the requests that are being made by the crowd, he, he moves and maneuver, maneuvers his way to Jesus and he falls at his feet and he implores him, to come with him to lay his hands on his daughter so his daughter would be well and live. Well, very similarly, there was a movie that came out in 2002 that had a, the pain and the parental desperation found in the father. And this movie is called John Q. I remember watching John Q and I watched it again recently because this passage reminded me of what Denzel Washington, who played John Q, actually endured. John Q found himself 
as a father and as a husband in Chicago. And um, he was going through some hard times and uh, was not making a lot of money. And uh, his hours were being cut at his job. He went from full time to part time. Some of us can relate to her in this cur current COVID situation, right? And um, his job cuts his hours. And in doing so, his insurance gets transferred. So now Jairus, uh, uh, Denzel or John Q finds himself in a very difficult situation. He's having to find um, some money. And at the beginning of the movie, uh, his car, one of his, his wife's car gets repoed and it gets taken off because he wasn't able to keep up with the bills. And, uh, but one of the things that they had was love, right? So Denzel, his wife, uh, so John Q and his wife and his, and his son, uh, they go to this baseball game where his son is playing and they're coming to support his son playing baseball. And uh, his son hits, a, hits, a, hits the ball and he's running to the first base and he's, as he's rounding the bases, uh, his heart gives out and he collapses. John Q runs and sprints to his son and his wife sprints as well and they come and scoop him up and they take him to the truck and they drive uh, feverishly down to the hospital. They take him out of the truck and they get into the hospital and they're asking what can be done, what can be done, what can be done, what is wrong with our son? And they cut the sh his shirt and they open it up and they run all these different exams on him only to find out that he has an enlarged heart and that he only has a, a, a few moments, or weeks, maybe months to live. And as a father and as a parent, um, that's scary news to hear. Nobody wants to hear that their, their child is at the point of death. This fourth quarter, there's nothing else for us to do. The only thing that we can really hope for is potentially having somebody that has the same blood type as his son and potentially having a, a small enough heart to be able to fit and everything to become cohesive. So now John Q and his wife are in desperation and they're asking what to do, only to find out that their insurance is not covered for this type of procedure. So now John Q finds himself in a precarious situation. His wife is looking at him for him to do something. His, uh, the uh, hospital officials are now saying, hey, you need to come up with the money uh, because your insurance does not cover this. So John Q now needs to go to his, he goes to his, his church family, he goes to his family, his friends, he sells his other vehicle, um, he sells whatever he, he can to be able to raise the money to be able to support his child who's going into uh, heart surgery, only to find out that he does not have enough. Not enough for the down payment, not for anything. And his son is growing closer and closer and closer to death. And his wife, during a scene, gives his John Q uh, a phone call and says, you need to do something. Do something, do something, do something, which triggers as a father for all of us to, to, to move. We, we need to move. And now uh, John Q finds himself in a position uh, where he's yelling at people and he makes this, uh, these statements. He says, I am not going to bury my son. My son is going to bury me. He says, my son is sick. That's it. There is nothing else. And he says, when people are sick, they deserve help. Sick, help. Sick, help. So now John Q is at a point where he's asking and he's pleading for help, right? And Jairus is in a very similar situation and he's pleading for help. So listen, our parental desperation can either drive us to despair or lead us to our divine destination. I'll say that again. Our parental desperation can lead, either lead us and drive us to despair or it can lead us to our divine destination. Verses, verse 24 says, and he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. So now Jesus walks with him. Jesus heard his reply and he's walking with him. Now, this is a key, a key point because the fact that Jesus is able to walk with us in the midst of all of these other requests knows that he's just for you. He hears you and your request and he's able to walk with you. It's good news because as a parent, sometimes we feel like nobody understands what we're going through. Oftentimes we feel like we don't have the blueprint or a game plan on how we need to parent. Um, sometimes we feel like we may not be doing a really great job. But the fact that Jesus is able to be with us and walk with us is really, really good news. Amen. So the Bible says this. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. So all, within all the requests, Jesus hears him and is walking with him. Now there's a little shift right now in the story. Because as they're walking with them, 
Verse 25 says, a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, came in, up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. So now we have all of these requests and everybody's like, oh, wait, 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 Jesus. Uh, we have these requests and you're listening to the synagogue official. Can you hear my reply? And this woman who has been broken over and bent over for 12 years with the hemorrhage and the blood issue now finds herself going through the crowd as well and touches his cloak. Now she had faith enough to be able to press through the crowd and touch his cloak. And he, she says this. For she thought in verse 28 that if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Verse 29, immediately the flow of her blood has, was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed in her uh, was healed of her afflictions. Verse 30, immediately Jesus perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? Now, the disciples are, are looking at this and they're like, hey man, this, this I mean, it's this, this probably hundreds of people gathered around you and we're all walking. So people are probably bumping into each other as we're walking. Jairus is like, hey, man, I need you to get to my daughter because time is of the essence. Time is ticking. We're in the fourth quarter. I need you to get to my daughter because my daughter is growing, growing sick and is dying. It's at the point of death. All right. So now this woman comes in and she touches him and Jesus is like, wait, who just touched me? So the disciples are like, man, how are you going to ask who touched you? We have all these people around you and we're all trying to make it to the synagogue official's house. Uh, verse 32, the Bible says, and he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down at, uh, before him and told him the whole truth. Verse 34, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Next point. Our parental desperation sometimes get, gets interrupted. Between the verses of 25 and 35, Jairus is now like, hey, Jesus, Jesus is walking with me. Awesome. Great. Let's press in. Let's let's move. Uh, let's get to my daughter so that she can get well. I have confidence and I have faith that if Jesus touches her, she will get well. But now here's the issue. Jairus is now finds himself in a position where he needs Jesus to get to his daughter. But then he gets interrupted by another woman who has a pressing need, who has had a need for 12 years. But I can only imagine as Jairus is thinking about this, he's like, yeah, but she's not at the point of death like my daughter is. Yeah, she's been, she's been suffering for 12 years, but I need him to come to be with my daughter. And some of us may have faced this uh, similar situation, but we've been praying and we've been praying and we've been praying for God to come through for us. And we know that our uh, church family members or our friends or our neighbors have been praying very, very long and diligently as well for their for their for their inquiries and their their requests. And God seems to come through for them, but he hasn't come through for you yet. And oftentimes we get a little we grow a little weary when that happens, because God, the time is of the essence. I need you to come here. If you don't come in time, she could die. Their situation is probably important as well. And, and praise God that you healed her. Praise God that you have done something for her. But I need you to continue to do something for me. Like, come, come, come for me. And so Jairus now finds himself interrupted. They probably had to stop. Jesus has to turn around. No, Jesus, I don't need you to stop. I don't need you to turn around. I need you to continue the momentum of us moving towards my house because my daughter is dying. Next point. In verse 36, the Bible says, but Jesus, overhearing what has been what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. See, our parental desperation will cause Jesus to remove doubters. In verse 35. Uh, the Bible says, while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Now, this is potentially family members, friends, whoever is at the house. And they're just like, hey, man, it's over. She's dead. She's dead. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So don't don't trouble the teacher anymore. Uh, just let's let's move on. And as a father, Jairus is probably like. See, I knew it. Like, I, I knew it. Jesus, if you would have like 
I, I needed you to come here on time. Like if only if we could have teleported from the seashore to my house and you could have healed her and you could have touched her, she would have been alive today. And so it's probably frustration, it's probably doubt, and it's probably confusion, it's probably even despair, loss of hope. And Jesus not answering them, almost ignores them, and, and he points back to Jairus and he says, listen, verse, verse 36 says, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And verse 37 says, and he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came, out of the, uh, they came to the house of the synagogue official and a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. So at this point, the daughter is dead and there's people all around and they're crying and they're weeping, they're wailing. Oh, God. Oh, it's over. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. And Jesus has to say, hey, man, get all of them out of here. Get, get all of them out of here. Right. In verse 39, he says, and entering in, he said to them, uh, why make a commotion and weep? This child is not dead, but she is asleep. In verse 40, they all began laughing. Now, they're, they're, they're weeping and crying, and Jesus says that she's asleep and not dead, and they laugh at him. And putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and, 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 uh, and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. In verse 41, taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translates, little girl, I say to you, get up. See, Jesus needs to sometimes remove doubters. Sometimes we may have some family members, or our own parents uh, who are grandparents at this point. Sometimes we may have some co-workers. Uh, potentially, we may have some people that just doubt in general. And we're talking to them about our situation and they're like, girl, I don't know what you're going to do with your child. Man, bro, listen, man, man, bump all that, man. You probably just, man, man either whoop her tail or just do something, right? Like sometimes we get some bad advice of, what we should do as parents, but God is like, hey, I need you to focus. I don't need your focus to be off, uh, off tilted. I don't need you to be listening to nonsense. I need you to refocus on me. What did I say in my word? What, what, what is, what is uh, the plan that I have laid out for your, your children? Um, and so, and so Jairus has to be reminded that, hey, I don't need to listen to these doubters. And, and God removes them out the way and says, I need you to focus on me. And I need you to believe. Do not fear, but believe. So he says this, verse 41, the child, he took the child by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk for she was 12 years old. Next, our parental desperation would cause Jesus to raise our dead situations. Uh, if you could turn to Luke chapter 18, verse one through eight, I don't have time to go there, but you can read that on your own. It's a story in a parable um, about a lady and a woman who has uh, found herself in, in an unjust situation. And uh, she's pleading with this unjust judge to show her justice and to show her mercy. Give me justice. And for day and night, day and night, day and night, she is imploring of this unjust judge. I need justice. I need justice from my enemies. I need justice. And this unjust official who obviously is unjust, finds himself and says, hey man, I'm gonna just give her what she wants. She keeps banging on my door day and night. She keeps coming after me day and night. And just to get her out of the way, I will just do it for her. And Jesus gives this parable for us to say, hey, let us be relentless in our faith in Jesus. Let us be relentless in our request of Jesus. Let us not grow weary in our request as a parent. Our children may be uh, uh, going down a dark road. Our, our children may be doing the wrong things, saying the wrong things, hanging with the wrong crowd. But God wants to refocus us and say, hey, what did I say in my word? I need you to believe. I don't need you to believe what uh, the stats say. I don't need you to believe what uh, their friends say. I don't need you to believe what your family may say. I need you to believe what I said. I need you to re refocus your attention on me and have faith in me. And if you do that, the Bible says, I will raise your, de your dead situations. We've seen it all through scripture and I can attest to you in my own life. If you stay, stand fast and stand firm in the fact that Jesus will come through for you, you can have faith in him. I, you can bet your last dollar that he will come through for you if you have faith. And tucked in this uh, verses 21 through 43, we see two people. That's Jairus, Jairus and we see the, the woman who has been bent over for 12 years. And both of their issue is 
come to me in faith. And initially, both of them come to him in faith. They implore him. They fall at his feet and they're asking for a request. And Jesus heals both of them. Jesus heals her and he's also able to heal Jairus's daughter. And so we see in verse 41, he does that. Verse 42, verse 42, immediately the girl got up and began walk to walk. For she was 12 years old and immediately they, be, they be, were all astounded based off of what has happened. It's very similar to what the old folks used to say. He may not come when you want him to, but he's always on time. At the end of John Q, John Q has grown desperate to the point where he has held everybody hostage and has locked down the hospital until he finds support for his son. John Q is now in this situation where media coverage is all over the place. He's on a one on one with uh, the police department um, and they're all trying to figure out a way to get him out of the uh, out of the hospital, get the hostages out of the hospital because this man has gone crazy. And when you go through parental desperation, sometimes you can go crazy, amen? <laughs> so John Q is now in this situation where he's trying to figure out, I need to find whatever, whatever means that I need to go through to find some support for my son, I will do it. And sometimes you and I may be in that same situation as parents. I will do whatever it takes for my child to get out of the situation that they're in. I will do whatever it takes for my child not to suffer. I will do whatever it takes for my child not to go down the wrong path and to suffer and to do the things that I did as a, as a child or to experience the same things that I experienced or to experience some of the things that I've seen that could potentially happen for those who are going down this road. Sometimes our parental desperation would drive us to the point where we need to find divine support and it would drive us to our divine destination. So now John Q is at this point where he's uh, now willing to even kill himself to be able to get his heart out of his, his body and place it in his son. But throughout the movie, in the beginning of the movie, we kind of see this lady who has no part of the movie, so we think. And she's on this road and she's driving and she's swerving in and out of lanes and she finds herself uh, hit by a truck, a Mack truck. Kills her instantly. Well, right at the right time, they were able to find this person which is the only heart in all of America at this, at this particular moment. And they fly in helicopter and they, they first of all, they take a jet uh, to O'Hare in Chicago. And then they take a helicopter down to the hospital right at the nick of time, right when John Q was about to pull the trigger on himself, they were able to bring this lady's heart in and it happens to be the exact fit and blood type that is needed to save his son. What's my point? My point is this, sometimes our parental desperation can either lead us to despair or can lead us to our divine de uh, destination. And our divine destination is Jesus. And sometimes he doesn't come when, he, when we want him to, but he's always, always on time, always on time. And the good news is this, even though we may be going through this situation right now currently with our children, God has an answer. God has a solution. God has a plan. And, and as crazy as that may sound, and as a parent, we may like, yeah, but I've been in this for, for many years. This girl was 12 years old and was at the point of death and actually died or went to sleep, Jesus says. But there's also, this woman has also, uh, other women in verses 25 through 35, was in this situation for 12 years as well. And she was healed. May not come when you want him to, but he's always on time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for your word. God, we're thankful, Lord God, that you may not always come when you want us to, God, but you're always, always on time. God, very similarly, you did this in Luke chapter 11, Lord God, with Lazarus. And God, uh, you allowed Lazarus to be in the grave a little bit longer than what uh, his family members and his brother and sister wanted. Uh, God, uh, but God, you uh, as a friend raised them up at the right time. And so, God, I thank you, Lord God, for uh, that. I pray for those who are in parental desperation right now. They feel like there's no hope. Um, whatever they do, they've, they've tried um, all this type of support groups. They've tried counseling. Uh, they tried uh, putting them in um, uh, programs and sending them off to camps and uh, nothing just seems to work. But God, you are, you are the, our solution. God, you have the ability to change our situations. God, you have the ability to resurrect our situations. And so God, I just implore you today, God, uh, God, I pray for our children. God, I pray for our parents. God, I pray, Lord God, that you would able, be able to reconcile us, God. Allow us to get back on track, Lord God. I pray that you would heal. 
I pray that you would deliver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. We hope and pray that you've been encouraged, equipped, challenged, and changed by the Word of God. If you are currently without a church home, we would love for you to be a valuable part of our Crossover Bible Fellowship family. If you are unsure about your relationship with Christ or unclear about how His gospel applies to you, we would be excited to walk with you through what it means to be saved. Simply reach out to us at membership at crossoverbf.com.